specificity, and we were here. Right. So as a quick reminder, where we were at was we were looking at um, breast cancer data, and so this is a simple problem because it's a yes/no, right? And so we can um, calculate the uh, confusion matrix for each label right? and think about how well we're predicting each category. So let's look at overall stuff. Right? So a true pro positive okay, for the yes category would be that um, breast cancer was indicated and it's actually breast cancer, so that's a true positive, a hit. Okay. A false positive would be where breast cancer was indicated and it's not breast cancer. Okay, so that's sometimes called a false alarm. True negative is where instances where breast cancer was not indicated and it's not breast cancer, that's a correct rejection. And a false negative is where it was breast cancer and you missed it, okay. um, which is often called a miss. Now, there's this little function that we imported earlier that will display the confusion matrix, but honestly this is um, just like a fancy version of the confusion matrix function in scikit-learn, and it just tells you which one's actual and which one's predicted. Accuracy is a measure of the diagonal here divided by the total. So we're doing pretty well, right? We only missed five of the instances. And so from those true and false positives and negatives. <laughs> we can calculate model performance. And overall accuracy is essentially um, true positives plus true negatives for both groups divided by the total. And so it's the overall proportion of correct predictions. Like most people can get accuracy, it's like getting a score on a, on a homework assignment. And so what I'm going to do here is just say, well, so this is true positive, this is a true negative for that first class. Since there's only two classes, accuracy ends up being the same. Okay. I can do the math here. Okay. The real accuracy using scikit-learn's accuracy score, where you compare the test to the predicted, okay, the real data to predicted, is 96% rounded up. Okay. Proof that that formula is correct it's the same answer. Okay. Now, for precision, or sometimes called positive predictive value, okay, it's the number of times that you were right for one of the classes. So you can do this for both classes, but it's a true positive. So getting the answer right divided by true positives plus false positives, or you guess that that class happened and it didn't. So back to our PHP, Python, C++ example, this would be it is Python divided by it is Python and we got it right, plus we guessed Python and it was something else. Uh, so precision here for the breast cancer class is 95%. And we could calculate this, flip this, and calculate it for only the not breast cancer class. Recall, sometimes called sensitivity, okay, identifies the percent of true positives actually captured. Okay, so it's true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. So uh, back to our Python example, this is Python divided by times that we missed Python totaled up. And for our breast cancer example, it's 98 percent, so what, or 99 if you round. So what we want to see is high accuracy, high precision, and high recall. We can also calculate the F1 score, which is a harmonic mean of precision and recall. Now it looks weird because when we think of means normally as average, uh, you know, totaling up divided by the total, but a harmonic mean puts the weight towards the larger group. So the denominators here are different in precision and recall. So this is the formula for the harmonic mean. And what we find is that it's 97%. Now, I personally like seeing precision and recall, and I don't really use F1 that often because it's just a, a, a collapse across those two. I'd rather see positive predictive value and sensitivity um, or precision and recall, whatever you want to call them. 
uh, but people will report it, so I think it's important to know what it's it, what it is. But it's just kind of a um, a weighted average of those two. Yes. Recall. Let me back up. Recall here. So it's the proportion of true positives divided by true positives, like so it's getting it right, uh, and misses. So precision is when is like the number of times that you get it right divided by the number of times you guessed that category. Right? So you don't want a lot of false positives because this is not a good thing. Whereas recall is the number of times you got it right by the times that you actually missed for that category. So the main difference is this piece. Yeah, no problem. So we actually never really use um, correct rejections. Okay. Uh, we're pretty much only averaging, like if we go back and look at our little picture here, we um, never really use true negatives, except in accuracy. It's part of the total. We're either going across or down. Okay. And these are conditional probabilities is all they are. So another thing we can do is make an ROC curve. What the heck is an ROC curve? Well, it's a receiver operating characteristic curve, which is a total mouthful. So sometimes we'll call this a rock analysis or an ROC analysis. And what it does is it allows us to uh, plot the relationship between true positives and false positives for a particular um, um, analysis. And what we want is an indication for true positives. So ROC analyses really only make sense when there's two groups. Okay? So if you have three, four, five, eight groups, you have to kind of do one versus two, one versus three, one versus four. So they're really popular when you have, um, you know, sort of an event versus not. So like HIV versus not, breast cancer versus not, COVID versus not, right? Um, where you're trying to make sure that your test gives you only true positives. Right, when people have it, they actually get the test indicates they do. Um, so I would say I don't see these a whole bunch when there's like five or six categories because then you'd have to do a bunch of pairwise charts. Okay. Um, but when you see one, what you want to see is uh, everything, the, the blue line here represents the relationship between true positives and false positives. Okay. Sometimes this is graphed as sensitivity and specificity. Uh, the dotted line here would mean no, um, no ability to classify. Okay? That is like perfect guessing. So you want to see the curve bent towards that true positive rate. So you want pretty much the curve to be, if in a perfect world you get everyone right, that never really happens, but if you could, sorry, get everyone right, it would go straight up and then across. We're so close at like 96, 97 percent, but that's why it's very close to being perfect over here. Okay. Um, you don't want to see the curve bend below the line. That means you're doing worse than just guessing. Okay, it means you're going to false alarm a lot, which we don't want. So these are really, really a nice visualization of a two-way kind of graph. But let's flip back now to our particular problem from the beginning. So as a reminder, we're trying to predict the category in which Stack Overflow stuff goes in. Okay, so we picked Python, PHP, and C++, or I did, um, as three languages that are somewhat similar um, in, um, in so much their, their uses are pretty different, right? Uh, but practically, um, code-wise, are moderately similar. Uh, so we're going to take that bag of words method okay, as the features for our analysis. So we we spent the first half of this lecture really talking about there's two places we can man really manipulate stuff. It's in that feature extraction method or it's in the, here, um, uh, the learning algorithm. Okay. This isn't a machine learning class, but I'm going to show you a couple of them, right? But I'm, gonna I'm really going to talk about feature extraction a lot. So what we can do, we've already done all that. Um, 
is extract features. <clears throat> okay. And one of the most popular ways to do this is the bag of words method. Okay. And we're going to do this two ways. Um, the count vectorizer function okay, allows us to transform into bag of words. So bag of words, remember, is just a, a set of vocabulary. So we looked at all of our text documents and we have a list of all of the words used. Okay. <coughs> That's the words part and the, the vocabulary that you'll see. Uh, then, that's columns, for rows, what we end up with is every document. And document here can be tweet, it can be sentence, it can be full PDF text, document is just whatever text we're working with. Then inside that matrix, we have word one and document one, and it's just a count of how many times word one occurred in document one. Some of you may be familiar with one hot encoding, where it's a, a kind of a binary encoding system where we say word one is in document one. Okay. And it's just yes, no encoding. Yes, it's in this document or no, it's not. Okay. That's also pretty popular. And if you wanted to do that, you would turn binary into true. Okay. And that would be a one hot encoder. I think you lose a lot of information about the frequency of, of text objects if you use that type of encoding. And it's not, it's not quite bag of words at that point. Um, but instead we're going to use, uh, the function is called count vectorizer, but this is a bag, like a raw bag, bag of words encoding where each cell represents the count, the number of times it has occurred in that document. All right, so what we're going to do, and I can't remember if I'm going to use cross-validation score or not, so we may not do that in this lecture, but... If you want to do some cross-validation, this uh, function in scikit-learn is pretty good. So we're going to build our blank feature extractor, bug crawling on me, um, where we're going to say do actual counts. So it will count the number of times that you know somebody used the word, um, like in PHP. In, uh, what's a good PHP word? Oh man, I was writing PHP earlier. I think I could remember the words uh, array. Okay. <clears throat> and, and it'll tell us how many times that word has occurred. Okay. Minimum DF here is the number of, uh, this is a proportion in this case, okay, of the number of times it has to occur. Okay. So you could say that the word has to occur at least 2%. Uh, which would be 0.02 as a proportion, but if you want every single word, just put it to zero. Okay, so the word has to occur, at least occur. Max DF here is the uh, maximum proportion of time. So you could cut off the bottom and or the top if you wanted to eliminate very low frequency or very high frequency words. Okay. And there's some advantage to eliminating low frequency words because they are not very useful because they occur so infrequently. And then there's an advantage to eliminating high frequency words because they occur so often that they're not indicators. So they don't really predict what group they are. I always encourage people to start where, um, unless you have a previous um, kind of draft of this, but always start with zero and one and see what happens uh, and then squish them as needed. So this is an empirical question where I could test multiple models and change those cutoff scores. Um, but I think in general, usually all the words are helpful. And if they're not helpful, it gets washed out by the other ones. Now this decode error one is just a good, op oh, sorry, just a good option to include um, because it will take out sometimes what are called bad bytes. And generally, these get eliminated when you do text normalization, which we did um, last week. But every once in a while, something sneaks in there, and it just like is a terror. If the error message is not clear, it's like X is numeric and R, which is my number one most useless error message. Um, uh, the other one is unexpected, unexpected value or something like that, uh, where you've forgotten a comma in a list, right? So uh, this just will help if you have something in there that it doesn't like to count. 
very well. All right, so let's do that. We're going to apply the CV, the count vectorized to our data set. You do need to make sure this is set up as a string, which we did earlier by changing it to a NumPy array, in, an, a string NumPy array, instead of a pandas data series. And that has been tokenized already. So the input to this is our normalized corpus, our, our cleaned up data set that's been tokenized and um, wait, has it been tokenized? That's actually a good question. Am I channeling last night's lecture? The problem with teaching three nights in a row, very similar things, is that sometimes, um, sometimes I forget what I am doing. Uh, actually, news groups. Wait, I've been talking about Python. I think I'm I'm channeling. <laughs> I'm channeling my other lecture. We're not doing Python. We're doing news groups. I'm sorry. Monday, Tuesday nights, I am doing this very similar thing, and we're doing um, Word to Vec, and I am channeling that lecture right now. So we have not normalized. You don't normalize. Um, we have not um, uh, tokenized yet, so there's no tokenization. And in this example, we're actually predicting hockey, hardware, mid uh, politics. Sorry about that. I am remembering the wrong lecture. Okay, so when we normalized though, here's what we did, right? So we took out the uh, HTML, we lowercased everything, we removed contractions. You can also do this kind of thing. Um, we switched it to Unicode. We took out all of the special characters. We also stemmed it and took out stop words. Okay. So this is very cleaned up. And we are now going to see if we can predict uh, which Reddit thread this is um, using bag of words methods. Now that we're back on the right example. I should just make them the same so I don't keep doing this. All right. Here. Okay. So what goes into here, sorry, is a NumPy array that's a string, but it's not tokenized yet. So the count vectorizer will handle the tokenization. Now you do that for the, the training features. Um, and then this, this, this is a key piece here. So on um, the first time you run it, you do fit transform. Okay? And by fit transform, it, it, it tokenizes it and makes the vocabulary, the rows, and the documents columns. Okay? But it's really important. It's, it's calculating what vocabulary it's seeing. Here, when you do this on the test features or any new features that you're interested in predicting from your original model, you just do transform. Okay. Don't do fit transform twice. Okay. It will not run. Because transform here means fit it to this data set. So here's the original vocabulary. Map this new set of words onto the original vocabulary. Okay. So if there are new words it's never seen, in this, in the new set, right, in the testing set, it will ignore them. Uh, mostly because it doesn't know what to do with them otherwise, because it's never seen them before. All right, so the train features here are, um, <clears throat> are 14,000 documents by 92,000 words. Okay? So this is our document list, and this is the number of words that we have. And so that's just telling you the shape. And notice here that the um, test features, this is our other train test split, right? We had about 18,000 of them. Uh, but notice that the shape, the second shape is the same. Okay, so this is uh, a matrix of words as columns and documents as rows. <clears throat> so that was here, our feature extraction. Then now what is we're going to do the pick a machine learning algorithm. So I'm just going to show you log regression <clears throat> because many of you are familiar with logistic regression already. Okay? But if you aren't, I'm going to give you the very brief log regression overview. It's a popular technique. It's math. Okay? So I think one thing that I um, don't love about analytics is they're like, well, log regression is machine learning. I'm like, no, logistic regression is math which you can use 
in a statistics way, because I have done this, or for machine learning. Right? But it's a popular choice of math for the learning and classification kind of techniques. And uh, binary logistic regression helps us classify two outcomes, so like our breast cancer data. But multinomial logistic regression happens to classify between multiple outcomes. So we have um, about 20 classifications in this example. And so we're going to predict those with a multinomial case. The basic gist of the difference between linear linear regression and logistic regression is on a linear regression, okay, so we have y equals 0 or y equals 1. So our category we're trying to predict, like uh, politi politics, and then every other category, okay, um, is that it tries to say this is a straight line. Instead, logistic regression transforms this into a logit, okay, and um, creates these sine, wave, sine curves uh, that are the probability of being in each group. And if you notice the difference between the two is that you get a much better map of predicting the data, right? except for here in the middle. This is where you don't really know what it is. Right? Um, but you're better at getting closer to the dots. And so each data point, each document, will be given an odds of being in that category versus being in every other category. And so it ends up being a set of probabilities. So if you have 20 possible categories, you end up with a probability of being in sports versus everything else. And then a probability of being in hockey versus everything else. Okay, then that'll add up to one. You know, so we're taking that probability and placing it in each group. And then it picks the one with the highest probability as the, the group you would have classified it in. Okay. Now, that's really easy when there's two outcomes, right? The probability of being breast cancer versus not. Uh, but when you have 20, you end up with 20 little probabilities. Okay, that sum up to one. And you pick the one with the highest number. Okay. Uh, sometimes the problem with that, though, is let's say you have two of them, and they're both 15%. Um, but one of them is like 15.2 and the other one's like 15.1%. Well, it's going to pick the 15.2 one, even though they're very close. So, so one thing that I like to tell people to do is to print out those probabilities because you'll see where, you're, where and how you're getting them slightly wrong. Okay. But for right now, let's just look at can we even predict with text. Okay. So. General processing pipeline using scikit-learn is importing the algorithm. So we're going to pick logistic regression here. Okay. Create a blank model. Fit the data to the model okay, using the training data. Okay, so it's dot fit. Uh, then do dot predict for the testing data. And then calculate model performance. Just to confirm, linear regression. Wait, can you say that again? I'm not following your question. So let me back up. Uh, if I did a linear regression on a binary outcome, it would give me um, a B value, the difference between groups. Um, but you get a much better prediction if you transform that linear equation into a logistic equation or basically do a logit transform. Okay. Uh, logistic is never is not really linear anymore, right? Because this is clearly not straight. But it's still a generalized linear model. Is that what you're asking? Yes. So it still falls under the classification of a GLM. It's a generalized linear model um, uh, with a, a logit link as the um, shape, right? <clears throat> so binomial it, or a binomial distribution. Okay, logit is the way that it transforms into that. So we could do a generalized linear model where the distribution might be expected to be Poisson, right? Which is um, very highly skewed towards zero, and then just a couple of uh, big long tail. Right? So you can take the linear model and 
transform it from instead of thinking of it as normal, thinking of it as something else. So in this case, the something else is binary okay, or a binomial distribution. Um, and so the transform there is a logic. So yes and no. I would not call it a linear model because the, the equation is no longer straight, but it falls in this category of GLMs. All right, where was where were we at? Where was my, I went back, I think. Okay, so this is the path we're gonna take. So first step, logistic regression. Okay, you can also import this classification report, which is another way to um, print out the the results. Okay, instead of this imported one that we were looking at, and also accuracy score. Honestly. You just need classification report because the accuracy score is in the classification report, but I'm trying to show you some different code pieces here. <clears throat> uh, for logistic regression, I have included some of the um, <clears throat> specificities for this type of analysis, but I will tell you that many of these are the default. Okay, so an L2 penalty is the default. Um, the solver, for a while, um, the, the package scikit-learn was changing, and so you had to specify this or it blew up. But this is now the default solver as well, so the math form of what they're, what they're doing here. Uh, the multi-class equation here is uh, the default. It's auto, but we have set this to be more than two. But you can actually leave it out because it handles more than two by switching to this form. Max iterations, we could turn that up if we needed to, and it does if it fails to converge. Uh, C equals one, which is our kind of a start value and random state. I always pick 42, um, and the book has it as well as on a Hitchhiker's Guide joke. Right? As the answer to everything. So, build your blank model. Yes. Correct. So build your blank model um, to your C question. That is correct. Sorry. Make it clear what I'm answering here. Um, do, 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 do. Build blank model. Why do we have a random state? So the random state, right? Um, this is a closed form solution. I do believe logistic is. Yeah, because we're not iterating. But it helps to um, kind of tell it where to start. Because, right, so this is not a maximum likelihood kind of model. It doesn't really iterate. It has a solution. It has one solution. Linear models, that's the, the beauty of them, is like uh, least squares analysis has one answer. Now, I can use some like stochastic descent stuff that is iterating for a very, very large linear model. But in general, most of us are like, that's okay, great. But it has one answer mathematically. Um, but the larger the data set, the more complex that can be. And so a random state just tells it kind of where to start, um, you know, kind of in different places, so that if you run this analysis over and over again, um, one, you get the same answer. It's kind of like a set seed, and uh, you can kind of figure out how many iterations you're going to need because you're kind of telling it where to start. Does that make sense? It doesn't quite, it's not quite the exact same thing as the set seed, but it gives you kind of a similar feel. It does have, um, it's random state, sorry, not start. Um, it does have a default for that somewhere, but you can control it. All right, so great questions. Uh, blank model fit the data, right? So we put in our x comma y, so our train features, and then our train name. <clears throat> and then predict, so this is round step three, I think, now. So predict the new features. Yeah, I just saved that as y predicted. And I can pr print out the accuracy score all by itself, or I can print the whole big report out. And I love this report, right? So accuracy score, test label names by predicted. 
So we're getting 72%. And before anyone has a heart attack, remember this is 20 categories. So chance is 1 in 5. Or 1 in 20. So 5%. Sorry. Uh, or I can print this classification report. Okay. And this is really nice because it gives me all of those scores. Precision, recall, F1. Excuse me. And support here is sample size for each category. And this is super critical. I think a lot of times, and this is one reason I want to change the example data set because um, I think people miss, miss things here. When you have, um, especially a multi-class solution, you might have an accuracy score that you're happy with, right? So 72% is pretty good because we have 20 different categories and that's a lot. Uh, and so if I never looked at anything else, I could be like, yeah, we can predict a 70% accuracy, which is way better than 5%. Um, but what if you had one category that you never could predict? Okay. And so I always like really dig in to the precision and recall scores for each group. This is how you make your algorithms better. Um, or you can like just figure out like where am I getting this wrong? We'll talk about making a cute picture here in a second. Um, but if one of the categories is never predicted correctly, you should either drop it or never claim you've predicted it <laughs> because um, the accuracy might be high, but that category is totally, you can't get it. And so uh, the old homework has a two class solution and you never get one of them right. And people will tell me the model's great because it predicts with like 60% accuracy. And I'm like, ah, oh, you missed the memo. <laughs> Models that don't predict a category at all are not very good. Um, so if one of these was bad, I might consider dropping it and going through it to see if I can figure out why I'm not getting it well. Okay. Now, some of these aren't great. Like atheism here is not so great. Um, I wish all of these were higher. But uh, they're at least all above chance be one in 20 and I can do better overall but now I can see I can like dig in like where am I getting it most wrong and it's mostly the religion categories all right so let's try a different algorithm sorry it's just like you know are y'all aware of these like lantern fly thing yes no maybe so here in Pennsylvania there's like lantern bugs the little flies that eat the trees and they're invasive there's like one trapped up here with me and it's like crawling on my leg. They don't bite. They eat trees. I am not a tree. All right. So, sorry. It's like weird crawling sensation. Um, so, I, you know, it is, it's just one of those weird things about living up here. Lantern flies. Anyway. Uh, let's try a different algorithm. Okay. And this I really want to show you that the choice of uh, feature extraction matters and the choice of algorithm. Okay. So we're at 71%. Let's look at naive bays. Okay. And this graphic came up like really large for, ooh, wrong way, uh, for some reason. So naive bays, what it does is it calculates the prior probability. Anytime you hear the word bays, expect to hear the word prior. Okay. This is the probability of that label in the data set. And so in this particular sort of Reddit style data set, they're fairly equal, which is nice because the, the more imbalanced they are, the harder it is to predict the smaller categories. So for example, sports, motor mystery, or automotive books. Then the features are added. So the contribution of each feature is added to that category prediction. So what that means is the first feature, which in our case is one of the words, Okay. What is the likelihood of the um, feature label combination, basically? So what's the likelihood of feature one given that label? Okay. And then it does that for each feature. What's the likelihood of feature two given that label? Feature three. So this is all 92,000 words. And the weight of each of those probabilities is multiplied by the prior. And that's how you end up with this posterior distribution. So it's the probability of the labels you know, given all of those features. And so then the one with the highest probability is picked to be that category. So it sums all these likelihoods, um, and actually I think multiplies them. Um, and the 
one with the highest um, likelihood for each category is the one it picks to categorize into that group. Okay. And so we're going to do multinomial Bayes because we have more than, whoa, more than um, two categories. Okay. There's also a Gaussian multinomial in um, scikit-learn, but it has a bad tendency to crash. So uh, multinomial naive Bayes works a little better. Okay. And it actually is much easier. I mean, just there's almost no defaults. You could actually leave out alpha equals one, okay. but we'll build our blank model, okay. and then the set of procedures is the same. And that's why I like these so much is because it's really easy to run a bunch of different models and pick the best one. Okay. So fit the data, okay. um, predict the data, okay. and we've lost some accuracy. So we went from 71% to 70%. Not a huge difference, but it does decrease. And then we can look at like what's happening. So it's still religion. <laughs> so look here, the religion scores are particularly bad in some areas. Okay, here's a religion one. Um, so most of the shifting is of the religion ones. They go down a little. The nice thing is, like, if I have some really good scores in this model, some really good scores in my other models, I could actually combine two different models together to best predict um, a bunch of categories. It's a little more complex because you have to run both algorithms, and then, you know, for this one, if it's uh, for sale or motorcycles or baseball, take that answer, and in this one, if it's religion, take that answer. Like, All right, let's try one more. So I'm going to do support vector machines because I think they're really cool. And what it is, is this like, um, it finds the data in a hyperplane. So make, ooh, gosh, I can't control the sizes very well today. So essentially, look at this picture. So it maps them onto a multidimensional space. This is flattened down, so it's easier to see. And it says, okay, well, here's group one and here's group two. So in our multinomial scenario, here's um, atheism and here's everything else. And what hyperplane, right, through the data can I find that best separates group one from everything else? Okay. So a hyperplane is this idea of like the best, the, the line that best like breaks them in half. And so in this case, they drew some, some little lines on here. And of course, the black line is perfect, where it separates the stars from the triangles, whereas the blue line um, has a couple of little triangles that are on the wrong side. No data is this perfect, but isn't made up, right? So in reality, we'd have some triangles over here. Okay. And so essentially, it builds this like kind of like hyperplane of separation based on those features. Okay. And the hyperplane is considered the decision plane that separates the set of categories. So it kind of works in multi-D space. So let's try it. So we're going to use linear SVC. Okay. And it has some very similar setups to logistic, right? Um, so penalties, the regularization, as you said, kind of helps us figure out where to start and our random state. Uh, we fit the data, okay. and there are more things that you can can change here. These are just kind of the, the normal setups. Okay. So we fit the data, predict the data, and you see oh we've got even lower score now. So um, why do people like log? Well, it works, right? So logistic regression for a bag of words method appears to have won this round. The, the multinomial base is slightly worse, and a linear SVC is slightly worse than that. And it has the same pattern of slightly worse, right? The religion categories are still bad. Can SVM be used for a larger data set? I don't see why not. I mean, I've, I've run it on some pretty big data sets. Uh, by big, do you mean more examples, or do you mean more words, or both? Obviously, if you have more examples, you'll have more words, but there's an upper limit to the number of features that one can have. Yeah, I would think so, yeah. 
It didn't. These tend to run pretty quick. I haven't had any issues with SB, SBC, the linear SBC. But I'm also not working with gigabits of data, so take that for what it's worth. All right, so our results. They really do I honestly give you approximately the same results, but Logistic has a slightly better total accuracy. Um, and that accuracy level at 70% is not too bad considering we have 20 different categories. Now at 70% if I have two categories, I'd probably not be very happy. So you always have to frame accuracy within the, the scope of the problem so for part of speech tagging, if you're not hitting 95% accuracy, there are much better models. Okay. Um, but for this kind of thing, I would say 70% is pretty good. The talking, what people are going to do, I mean, if I think about Reddit style talking, who knows where these things go, right, if you've been on Reddit. Um, you could start in one place and end up on Mars. So um, the ability for us to predict this just simply from individual word counts is kind of amazing. But can we do better? Maybe. <clears throat> so one problem with a, a raw bag of words, like just straight counts, is data sparsity. So count bag of word models, I mean, they tend to work. Like that worked pretty well. But the issue here is that there are a lot of zeros in that data set, okay, where words never appear in a document. And then there are a lot of small numbers and only a few really large numbers. Okay, this technically would be, I guess, a Poisson distribution where we have a lot of zeros, a couple of small numbers, and then a long tail. And that sparse kind of matrix can make it difficult to predict from. It just it can be problematic. So one thing that people often suggest doing is a TF-IDA. Okay, that is a term frequency inverse document frequency weighting scheme okay. that it's not a probability distribution like most latent semantic analysis uses this kind of transform but things like topics models use a probability transform this is sort of a, a weighting scheme that looks at how often a word occurs total across all documents and then how many words there are in each document to kind of create a weighted score for that word to that document. I just, like a um, couple, like a month or so ago, figured out that, well figured out, I learned on from Twitter that the TF IDF vectorizer in scikit-learn is actually not the normal one. So, there's that. Um, oh, I'm going to hold that. You hold that thought. Hold it. Um, so uh, I actually, I don't know if I want to recommend Scikit-Learn's TF-IDF, even though I have it here in the notes. There's nothing mathematically wrong about what they're doing, but there's a big old argument on their help GitHub page about this exact problem where they are using a slightly different formula than the sort of normal one. There's actually multiple TF-IDF formulas, believe it or not. And there's the one that like has most people have agreed upon, and then there's the one that they're doing. Um, I had an analysis recently where we ran it this way, and then I went back and changed it and ran it with Gensum because Gensum does the normal one, and it didn't really change um, because of the type of data we had. But I will I will just give you that warning that I've learned recently that this formula does some weird things with the denominator as part of the transform. Now, can we use PCA on sparse data? I probably, I don't know that I've tried it. Right? Because that would go from having our features be words, right? So this is a document by terms matrix. That's the whole point of bag of words is you still have the words in there, right? So each column is a word. And what we're changing right now is that there's either a, um, a uh, raw count or it's a, a weighted probability basically. Um, if you apply a PCA to a raw bag of words, what you end up with is documents by dimensions. And so certainly you can do that. 
but the interpretation of the output might be slightly different because it's dimensions and not documents and not words anymore. Um, but that's an acceptable transform because, for example, if um, in our in our next set of lectures we're going to talk about topics models um, as as a a useful thing for sentiment analysis, sort of in our example. Um, that ends up being a documents by topics or dimensions matrix instead of uh, words. So people do it, yes. I have not personally done PCA on it, but you could. Just like you could do factor analysis or a uh, uh, singular vector decomposition as well is a popular one. And that's what LSA uses. So good question. All right, but we're going to stick with words right now because we're talking about bag of words methods. The tfidf function says use tidf equals true, and then we have the same kind of, of uh, min and max characterization, so we can um, change that. Okay. So blank model, fit transform, just transform, so it works almost exactly the same as, as count vectorizer. It's a nice thing about using the same ones from the same package is they have very similar code. And you'll see that we have the same shape of the data. Okay? So we have not like dropped words or anything like that. We've just changed the internal representation from raw counts into a, a weighted count or a weighted probability really. So let's just try those and see what happens. Okay, I'm going to retest logistic regression. So I fit the data, I've predicted the data, and now I've jumped up to 75%. Okay, so I gained three whole percent on just changing from raw counts to a regular, essentially a normalized count. Am I doing any better at religion? No, not really. All right, so that's pr pretty bad. Um, Christian's okay. Another religion one. Atheism still okay. So we've gotten some extra um, predictive power, but it might not be in the worst categories. It looks like it's kind of been spread out across all these categories. So 75%. Hold on to that. Let's look at multinomial base. Okay, so I'm gonna fit my model, okay. and our accuracy also increased, but log is still winning to 73%. But you can see here that like religion is particularly bad. Uh, and support vector machine. Okay. And this one actually jumps up to 78%. So last version, it was like 68, 69, no, 66%. This actually jumped 11 points. And so now this one wins. Where given the um, combination of feature extraction and math algorithm method, we can get different answers. So that's why I always suggest running um, a couple different versions of these because it's not always easy to predict which one is going to be best. Right? We could have gotten the same pattern and said, okay, well, it's log, but clearly that didn't happen. Right? So in this case, I would pick a TFIDF as my feature extraction and a linear um, support vector machine as my algorithm because it's the best predictors. And we can see that like kind of overall, all of them are getting a slight bump to get us up to 78%. Now, I could make this like incredibly <laughs> impossible to read confusion matrix. Okay. I did have to upgrade, make sure you're, um, for this next piece down here, I did have to make sure I had uh, sklearn uh, 0.22 as the the version. So if you have an old an old earlier version, you can't make the pretty picture. So upgrade versions. Um, but I can confusion matrix like the function is only really useful if you have like two or three. <laughs> the larger it gets, the more impossible it is to read. So instead, there's this amazing plot confusion matrix picture. And so I put in the model classifier that I decided was the best. I put in the test features that were part of that model. The, I'm um, sorry, the, the test features that match onto that feature extraction. 
the test label names, the answers, and then a uh, vertical here just keeps them in a readable way. It kind of cuts off a little bit, but I, that's because I didn't work super hard with um, matplotlib to make this pretty, but you can. So plaque the matrix and then show the picture. Okay. This is, assumes you have imported matplotlib, which we did many slides ago. And look how cool it is. I love it. Um, so what it is, is it's this plot. So it's 95, 137, 144, et cetera, et cetera. Color coded. So the diagonal here is the right answer. That's when you've guessed that's like a true positive. And the off diagonals are all the wrong answers. So the most interesting part, part to me is to see where we get it wrong. So when I'm guessing, the religion ones have mostly been the worst. Right, so when I'm guessing atheism here, or like when it's atheism, where am I getting it wrong? Well, over here is where it's going. So if I scroll down, oh, it's going to the Christian category. Well, at least I'm getting it wrong in a sensible way. Okay. Or if I go over here to the 10, it's in the religion miscellaneous category. So when we're missing it, it's very helpful to know that we're missing it in a way that's, that makes sense. We just can't seem to distinguish these three from each other. Okay. We kind of can, but it's not perfect. So maybe we just collapse them and say, well, these are all about religion. Okay. Or the lack of religion, I guess, for atheism. Okay. Uh, let's see if we can give it, let's give another good one here. Um, guns. Okay. So politics, miscellaneous. Okay. Uh, otherwise, it goes into politics, guns. So they're, they're, when they're wrong, they appear to be going um, to a similar category uh, that matches. <clears throat> um, wow, brain fart, sorry. When we're getting them wrong, we're getting them wrong in a, in a way that makes sense because they're moving from one category to a similar category. And I think that's a good sign that our model is pretty good. It's just maybe we don't have enough examples to help it fully distinguish between all these different things. Okay? And these heat map pictures just make it much easier to read. Okay? Now, sometimes we get it wrong all the way across. Okay? Politics, guns, just kind of in all of these, but these numbers are pretty low. Uh, there's ways to clean this up where you can read the numbers a little better because it, it like converts to scientific notation here in the middle for some weird reason. But just the very basic visual of the plot is what's handy. All right. Last thing we're going to cover here is word to vec. I'm going to give you the very brief word to vec overview. Okay. And what word to vec does is that it takes a bag of words approach and makes it a neural net model. Neural net models really try to represent the way that our brains work. Okay. So our neurons, there's no like Apple neuron. Okay. And um, instead, it's a set, it's a pattern of neurons that activate. So something that's red and it's brown and it's, if you eat it, okay, that represent Apple in the brain, for example. Okay. And so mo these models are kind of organized in layers that really show that sort of interconnected process that occurs when you have a higher level cognition, right? So we have um, different layers of the brain also, but then there's sections of the brain that do different pieces. So for example, Broca's and Wernicke's here are two of our big language centers. The back of your head is vision. The sections right here by your ears is uh, auditory. Right? You have a whole movement, uh, muscle cortex thing. And all of these layers talk to each other. Right? But there are sections of the brain where we're like, we don't know what that does. Right? And that's where the hidden layer comes in. Right? And so uh, a hidden layer is meant to represent these kind of processes that are happening, but we just don't really totally know what they are. Right? Um, so in our case, applying word to VEC to a neural net model is that we'll have a bunch of nodes. Those nodes represent words. And they're connected from input to output. So our input system here are all the words. The output system is the answer. Okay. And they're um, <clears throat> connected via weights. And those weights are adjusted by seeing more and more examples.
So this is a terrible example. I really need to find a new picture. But um, based on um, on um, drugs, right? So sodium, potassium, blood pressure, age, whatever. So we put in a, a layer of inputs. Okay, so if you were trying to predict what kind of drug people should get for their problem, you would say, you know, yes, this thing exists, or no, this thing doesn't. So in our example, this would be the features. Okay? And so we're inputting our sentences. There's a hidden layer where everything is connected through, and those are the weights that we adjust. So uh, sodium potassium for this example doesn't fit. Okay, and for this other example, that's the, thing, the most important thing. Right? So these weights are tuned by, by looking at the data. And then we have some sort of output. Okay? So it might tell us what drug to use. In the sense of training these models with words, what we get are the inputs, the context of the words around a sentence, and then the output is often what word it would predict would be in that sentence. So word to vec models are very good at predicting what word uh, occurs in context um, of other words. Uh, oh, hold on, don't get ahead of me here. Uh, coming up next, the types of word to vec. Okay. Uh, literally, you <laughs> like a slide ahead of me. Good, good guess. Uh, there's two ways to train, well, there's multiple ways, but there's two main themes to word to vec models. Okay. So, um, one issue with with going from a simple count vectorizer to a TF-IDF to this is that there, there are many places that you can tune and manipulate. Okay? And so the complexity gets much more, more complexity is how this works. Um, so when we were talking about count vectorizers, you could control the minimum frequency and the maximum frequency, and if it's one hot or count, okay? or a TF-IDF transform. Those are kind of the places I can manipulate things. In a word to vec model, we can manipulate um, the type of encoding, which is what this slide covers. We can manipulate the size of the dimensions, which we'll get to on the next slide. And we can also manipulate the um, window size. So there's even more places to, to tweak things. And then you pick an algorithm. So there's a lot of places that you can kind of tune here if you're interested in slowly kind of tweaking models to see which one runs best. So back to your question here, this is a continuous bag of words. It could be. So the left side here represents SIBO models, continuous bag of words models. And the way that these work is it takes a window size. And in this case, the window size is five words. And to predict the word fine, it looks at the words around it, and it averages across. So if you see and have an input of any one of these words, that will lead to a kind of an average representation where finds context is these four words. So the, the main distinct, the main, like the big like theoretical thing that we are getting with word to vec models is that a bag of words model loses context. You take all the words and you just count them up. You shake them up, you put them in a bag, this is where the phrase come from, comes from. And you have no concept of how this word was next to this word. You just have a global representation of them being in the same document. A word to vec model hangs on to context by representing the inputs through the hidden layer as an average. So the word fine is predicted by this sort of average um, uh, context. The alternative to that is to directly link each word to its context, and that's called a skipgram model, where um, any one of these words individually could lead to that output. Okay. This one sort of requires more of the, the whole context to lead to the output, unless there's just one word that's really strong. Okay. Um, and then in a skipgram model, any one of those individual words can, can produce the, the context. Um, there are pros and cons to each of these models, which is way outside this lecture, but uh, there are, you can change and pick either SIBO or SkipGram. Okay. So let's look at a word to vec. Okay. In this example, now channeling my lecture from Tuesday that I was mistakenly on earlier, 
you do have to tokenize. Okay. So the TF uh, functions and count vectorized functions in scikit-learn will tokenize for you. Word to vec requires it be tokenized first. And so we can do that with NLTK. So NLTK.tokenize.word tokenize from many moons ago, beginning of the semester. And so I have train and test here, break them down. Okay. I'm going to use Gensum here to run word to vec I love Gensum. It's one of my favorite Python packages. The first thing we change is the number of features. Okay. Before, what we did with our, t our, our count vectorizers and stuff was we had um, the documents by just the number of words. Okay. So this was just every possible word. And so we had 92,000 dimensions, okay, or features. The beauty of a word to vec model is that you don't have to be that big. I mean, you can't go that big, but generally um, you do this in the hundreds or the thousands and not the, the multiple thousands, okay. And so features no longer means words, okay. Features means the vectors of those contexts. I picked 300 because it seems to work pretty well, but this is a, a parameter in which you can manipulate. So you could start with, you wouldn't want to go super small, okay, like five would not be good, but you could start with a thousand and do a thousand ten, a thousand hundred, twelve hundred, thirteen hundred. Okay. We've run one of these where we did like a hundred to, to four thousand just to see what would work best. And like in that particular model, fifteen hundred worked really well. Okay. So pitch three hundred, so model's not too complex, so it'll run, but that is a parameter which you could change. So build our, build our model. You don't really build a blank one. You just start throwing things in. So um, we put in our training corpus. We tell it the size. This is the dimension of documents by features. Don't confuse that with window. Window is how big to make the context. Window is how big the, the, the amount of words around something to look. Um, <clears throat> This is word embeddings, yes. Word embeddings is what this thing is, is how big of the context to embed. Correct. Um, where am I going? Window. So sometimes I see people program these where the window size is like 100. And at that point, I'm just like, that is a huge document. So that's like context is so specific. I always tend to go with smaller window sizes, 6 to 10 because that is what literally people do when they're reading. Like in English, when we read, we're moving like that kind of size. Now, if you're doing this in another language, you could look up like, how many words do people read at once? If you're doing this in Chinese, that's gonna be totally, totally different because the characters are very different, right? But most Latin-based languages, we read about six to 10 words at once, meaning I look at it and I move, like visually reading. And so, I don't know, I think it's a misnomer to build models with huge windows because that doesn't no longer really represents what people do but that's another parameter you can sit there and, and tune right so now we're talking about is it skip grammar SIBO um, what's the size of the window what's the size of the dimensions so you've got a lot of points that you can sort of tweak to make your model better um, so this is my bias to go with smaller windows but certainly try it with the larger windows Minimum, this is minimum number of times to run. That's, I don't, that's a typo. Min count, how many times does it have to appear? Right, so two. Uh, SG here stands for skip gram. So if you set this to zero, it does a SIBO model. If you set it to one, it does a skip gram model. So I can change that. Iterations, five, kind of rotate through. And workers equals five. This is like threads on your computer. So if you have a, um, Sorry, Windows machine people. <laughs> if you have an older computer or a Windows machine, lower that number and it will tend to run a little better. Okay. I haven't given you anything so large that these models will crash, but the larger the data set, um, obviously the more work these models are. And so they're pretty complex. Now, the problem, like here, once we've built this model, there are some things in Gensum we can do with it. And mostly, often, it's predicting what word comes next. So the, the beauty here is that I have this beautiful model. Now, um, what it does is it predicts the next word, which is not quite what we want. What we want is to take out those embeddings 
to take out those vectors um, and use them in our machine learning model. So this giant function is it's from the book um, and I've seen other people using it too and it's really all it does is it takes each of those contexts for our um, our number, our size, our wind, uh, not window size, sorry, the um, dimension size. So for each of these hidden nodes, which is our dimension size, it takes all of those contexts that it has seen and sort of flattens them down and averages them. So what we end up with is sort of this documents by dimensions matrix that's a representation of a lot of those contexts. Do you lose information? Of course, because we're averaging over them, but there's no other real way to get that kind of uh, multi-dimensional data out. So what we end up with is dimensions, and we have a bunch of different contexts, and we kind of flatten them down. So now we have documents by dimensions. Okay. No longer documents by words. The words are flattened into that context. And that's all this does, is it like pulls them out and averages them. It looks crazy, but this is the function returns a NumPy array, which is great. And we can apply that to our training and our test features. I see you type it over there. No? Okay. Um, so we put in the corpus, the model itself, and then the number of features we want back. This is features. So this is that 300 size. Okay. This is not window size. And we... Um, are using in the second example we're using the um, the test data so it's applying the test like what do I have in the test data and creating those same dimensions out of the test data okay. so for this case it's pulling out the dimensions from the training data but then here it's looking at okay well here's what I have in the test data let's make those same dimensions but now in our test example so why do we use average features? Great question. Uh, otherwise, there's no good way to get the data out to do different math with it, right? So I can use the model to predict it. Really, what it does is it takes the context of the current window size and predicts what word should be in that window, which is not what we want. We want the model to predict the outcome, right? So what we're doing here is building the embeddings of those contexts to use as our um, features for log, SVM, etc. Uh, but to get them in a way that like dimension, documents by dimensions, we have to kind of flatten them back down. Because there's like no good way to grab all of them. <laughs> it, not by word, by dimension. All right, so the dimension size is the number of the, the hidden layers, okay? and so you lose words. So you're, you're averaging across context found in that document, as opposed to aver like looking at the words. So a, a count vectorizer matrix is documents by words, and the number in there is how many times it happened. This word to vec matri matrix is documents by, by dimension, and that dimension is part of the hidden layer. And so word, it's word context rather than word itself. Um, but the embedding layer of all of the words are represented in these dimensions. So it's not just one at a time. Does that affect interpretability? Oh, yeah. But I don't know that when I see people use 92,000 dimensions to predict that they ever look at what words it is that predicted. Does that make sense? <clears throat> So with our, our log, we can tell which ones we were um, predicting well, but I never went back and like got a coefficient of like, it's actually word two. I mean, you can, and you probably should, but most people just go, oh, here's the prediction. Okay. Um, what we'll do next week is we'll talk about the interpretable, the interpretation problem. Right. <clears throat> so what, uh, and this is one thing that Jonathan Korn is working on, is like taking a deep uh, he's using deep learning, so it's got multiple hidden layers. Taking that kind of model and using it to predict, and then using um, something like a topics analysis to actually pull out that interpretation. So you can do both.
whole bag of concepts. I've seen that a little bit too. I haven't read enough about it to really totally get it. But if you have a um, the reading or the thing you've looked at, I would love you can shoot it to me in an email. And I'll look at it too. Because I've seen some people. I've seen the whispers on this, right? But I haven't used it. I have not used it at all. I know it's a thing. That's all I know. Yeah, but a great question. You no longer can interpret dimensions in that. Now, could I tell um, maybe cluster documents and dimensions and kind of think about, like, well, these three dimensions are clearly about politics? Probably. But then you would be, you know, then you might be doing factor analysis to interpret those dimensions or um, cluster or something like that. All right, so let's try it. I, <clears throat> I got my log here. I've got my average features. Okay, I'm gonna predict, and it's terrible. Oh no! So it only gives us 54% accuracy. Okay. So the complexity. So I think people love love these neural net models. I mean, I like them too. They're cool. But there's like this super fascination with them right now. And I will tell you that they that added complexity does not always help. Okay. So if you're gonna run something that complex, be sure to compare it to something simpler like a log model, because clearly here that um, complexity did not add enough information. Now, maybe it's because of the number of dimensions, right? So our support vector model had 92,000 dimensions, words. This only had 300 dimensions, so I could try increasing the number of dimensions and see if that helps. Okay. Um, and that's what I, that's why I like um, these codings, and it's fairly simple to just inst to loop over running these, like, okay, um, 300 dimensions, okay, 400 dimensions, 500 dimensions, so just write a nice loop that um, runs many of these models. Okay. could also test this with Bayes, and I wanted to specifically show this example um, because this type of model, the, the weights are not all positive. Okay, so a count vectorizer and a TF-IDF, the, the numbers are all positive because they're counts. Um, and a word to vec model, the, the, tr the, it's an average weight. Weights can be negative. These things are not related. Okay. But Bayes, Bayes most definitely don't allow negative, <laughs> negative probabilities. So if you uh, want to combine a word to vec model with a, with a Bayes model, you just need to add a constant to your matrix to move everything into the positive dimension. We're just doing a simple linear transform, increase all the scores. So I just told it to find the minimum. And so, oh, interesting. I'm amazed this ran. I should have added five to each one. So I don't know how that ran. I'm surprised it didn't get mad at me. So you find the minimum and then add a, a number that's large enough to, to the data set to increase everything above zero. So like I said, I'm kind of amazed that that ran because I only added four. We should have probably added five or 4.5. As long as you add the same number to both, the, the representations between the data stays. It's just you've increased them all so that the model will run. Okay. I, guess it only ran. I think it's because I didn't fit the model with negative numbers. I don't know. So multinomial bays here. Our accuracy is only 40%. So we're doing even worse. And then let's just try one more time and complete our trifecta here of three different um, features by three different um, algorithms. So we've got nine models. And it still is like really bad. Okay. That's approaching like give, just give up now. Okay. And it actually shows me up here that it didn't really converge well. Okay. The model should have had maybe some more runs to, to run, but it's still really bad. And some of the predictive categories are zero. Okay. So what I found by looking at three different inputs, count vectorizer, TF, IDF, and a bag of words, a word to vec, or a continuous bag of words, word to vec, three different algorithms, um, log, Bayes, SVM, is that the perfect combination or the best combination is a SVM with a TF, IDF. Transform. Okay. 
And that would be the model I'd probably try to use if I was trying to predict. So in summary here, looking at all these different options for classification. So it's giving you three different feature extractions. There are places you can manipulate those and tweak them to better tune your models. There are obviously other types of feature extraction you can do. These are very popular. And then we looked at different um, um, algorithms very shallowly, like here are some options, here's some code for those. I'm really focusing on feature representation for words. Obviously, there's this bag of context, concepts model. Um, then we looked at focusing on the algorithm itself. And what we found by running nine of these different models is that the feature clearly has an impact as well as the algorithm. So the extraction method and algorithm interact and you get different answers. So I, I, I don't love when people ask me what's the best way and I'm like, <laughs> it depends on, the, depends on the task, right? There are, I, I've done one where we did like 400 different models, it was totally crazy. And I would have expected a latent semantic analysis or topics model to work best and they were total crap. Like they didn't run well at all. Like we ended up just like giving up on them completely. So um, I really encourage you to think about trying different combinations to see which one you should start with is then start tuning. Okay, I'm gonna pick the SVM and I'm gonna pick this one. I'm gonna just start playing with it, see if I can find how to improve that model even better.